Well, it's absolutely wonderful to see such a large number of people in the room this evening and uh, in particular such an international gathering. So uh, welcome friends uh, and thank you uh, so much to the uh, Quaker Socialist Society for offering this opportunity for, for me to share with you uh, something that I spend quite a lot of time thinking about. So we're going to focus on uh, something essential about the beginnings of Quakerism uh, and this is really quite a fleeting period right at the beginning of the Quaker movement when in a sense friends are literally turning the world upside down uh, an experience of living in heaven on earth and so our focus is going to be very much on that earliest vision how we can understand it but also the radical implications that flow from it. Uh, and they are significant. Now this material, I hope, will be inspiring to you, but I guess it will also be uh, somewhat discomforting. And I think there's two reasons for that. The first one is that uh, if you are less than happy with traditional religious language and in particular biblical language we need to recognize that the first generation of friends are operating within a biblical worldview and the language of the king james bible is very much their language so if you struggle with that try and see beyond those limitations uh, to what friends are trying to communicate about their experience the other really key element that will probably be disconcerting to us is that this radical vision really didn't last very long and we'll see the ways in which the Quaker community corporately becomes increasingly accommodated to the ways of the world and increasingly conservative with a small c uh, and really concerned for uh, maintaining a, a, a public image of respectability. And that has serious negative consequences for the radical vision of early friends. And it's a legacy that has affected us across our history. Let's hope though that in this first session, which we're gonna look at the radical vision, we'll see why it is that we should be inspired by our founding fathers and mothers. I'm calling this particular uh, section uh, the world turned upside down. It's a, uh, a phrase that's often used associated with the period of the English Revolution and the English Commonwealth, uh, famously used as a title of a book by Christopher Hill. But we can say that there's something about what the Quakers were doing in those earliest few years really did threaten to turn the way the world was at the time upside down and offer a very different vision uh, for the future. And so uh, let's see that, uh, that context, that vision. Just begin with, just, just for a moment, think about uh, the situation in 17th century England. It's very much a watershed period within English history. Uh, we see essentially it's the main point of transition between medieval feudalism, an agricultural based society, a society that's rigidly hierarchical and structured along the lines of the king at the top and then the aristocracy and then a middle class and then a peasantry at the bottom. Uh, and the idea that that is actually divinely ordained, that's a solid aspect of um, medieval Christendom and this is the period when that's beginning to break down the king being ordained by God having absolute power and so we're seeing in the English Revolution in a sense a bourgeois re revolution it's a movement from feudalism to capitalism and so this is the period when in English society certainly that's that's really becoming clear that we're in a watershed time and from then on capitalism develops colonialism develops, English society becomes enriched by 
the development of capitalism and the exploitation of other peoples and other parts of the world in colonialism. And of course, slavery is an essential part of that. And it's part of the story that we're going to be talking about. The Quaker scholar Doug Gwynne uh, has argued in one of his books that in the 1650s, at this watershed time, Quakers offered a fundamentally different possible way forward for English society and for the world. Uh, and he uses the word covenant. Now, covenant is a word we're going to come back to. Covenant is about a relationship. Essentially, in biblical terms, it's the, the basis of the relationship between God and humanity. And so Gwynne suggests that the radical vision of that first generation of friends offered an alternative way forward based on a particular relationship between God and humanity that would, cr would create a particular set of circumstances within the world, the heaven on earth that we're going to be talking about. However, it didn't last very long. The world rejected it, the world uh, fought it, the world sought to crush it. And so Gwynne argues that the covenant was crucified and with the death of that alternative way forward, um, it was the capitalist and colonialist vision that became dominant. Let's just think though about the situation in one or two key points here at the time. If you were an ordinary person living in this society, you would be regarded as fundamentally inferior to uh, the gentry, the aristocracy, uh, the royalty. Uh, a very rigid distinction, those who were born to rule and those who were born to serve. And of course, even with the parliament, it's only the gentry, the landowners who are represented, the mass of people are not. And so early friends are actually called the dregs of the common people. They tend to be fairly middling sorts, but that kind of gives you a sense of the way in which ordinary people are seen to be fundamentally inferior to those who run society. And of course, this is even more the case when we see the distinctions between men and women. Women are seen to be fundamentally inferior to men, uh, essentially uh, owned by either their fathers or their husbands, and really having no place at all within the public sphere of any significance. And in religion, of course, having no place in the ministry, having no rights to be in a leadership role, having any kind of significant role to play. George Fox talks about coming across some men who say, women, of course, don't have souls any more than geese or ducks. So that's the kind of situation we find ourselves in, very, very rigidly patriarchal society. Women seem to be inferior, men, and of course what we're really talking about is men of a certain social class being the ones who are born to rule and everyone else being inferior. Also the uh, cultural attitudes to people of other religions and other cultures is very, very negative. Uh, the, for example, uh, across uh, medieval Christendom in Europe, the Jewish people, the Jewish communities, were often regarded as the enemy within, the scapegoats, the people who were time and time again blamed for things that went wrong. And there were pogroms, you know, mass kind of murders of Jewish people, significant persecution, constant movement based on being booted out of various places. And so you see that very negative attitude to the Jewish people in this kind of context. But if the Jews were seen to be the enemy within, of course, it's slightly different in England because they've been excluded from England for uh, hundreds of years. The Turk or the Muslim, uh, the followers of Islam were regarded as the enemy without. The, uh, the marauding, heathen, evil kind of uh, powers that threaten uh, European Christendom. Uh, and of course, it, other, other people uh, of other religions also seem to be fundamentally outside of the acceptable forms of humanity. So often called pagans or, or heathens, people of 
uh, other religions. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Native Americans, of course, uh, and the attitude of, um, of, of, of Europeans to, to black Africans in terms of the transatlantic slave trade. So we can see fundamental, rigid, uh, unjust social distinctions and divisions and conflicts within this society. And it's in that context the Quakers are offering an alternative way forward that in some ways uh, breaks down very radically the fundamental basis of all of those social divisions. So it really is an assault on a fundamentally divided, unjust and hierarchical society. And we'll see that as we work through this early Quaker vision. What I want to argue is that if you look at the early Quaker uh, experience and interpretation, you will see that uh, there are a number of building blocks that help us understand their conception of the coming of heaven on earth and the fact that they feel as though they are already part of that process. They're in the vanguard, in a sense, of the fundamental transformation of all things uh, and the coming of heaven on earth, the coming of the rule of, of God, the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, and we're going to look at these in some detail, but just, uh, just, just a summary. Uh, what we need to understand is that uh, Early friends are often accused of neglecting the importance of the historical Jesus. Now, um, it's true to the extent to which they focus on something else, but we need to start by recognising that for early friends, as biblical people, it is the Jesus event, what we, what we often call the incarnation, the coming of, um, of Jesus as the word made flesh, God incarnate, that it's the action of Christ, the work of Christ, that makes all of these things possible. And so we often see, particularly in the writings of James Naylor, the sense that Christ achieves a number of things in his life, his death and his resurrection. He, he establishes a new humanity, a new way being, of being human, fully reconciled to God, fully in the image of God. He establishes a new covenant, a new relationship between God and humanity that's very different from the one that existed before. He establishes a new understanding of the people of God and he establishes the basis of a whole new creation, heaven on earth, the kingdom of God. And so that's, that's what friends feel they're participating in. So what makes that possible and what are the implications? Well, the first thing to say is that Pentecost is the key catalyst and enabler and the availability of the Holy Spirit uh, prompting these changes, enabling this transformation. That brings people into a new covenant relationship with God, which is inward and intimate and direct. That makes possible being in a new way of being human, what I'm calling prophetic, the idea that in this new humanity, God lives and speaks through the human creature. And a fundamentally new vision, a new perception of, of all things, what I'm calling the apocalyptic. What had been hidden is now being revealed. But we'll look at each of those in just a little bit more detail. The early Quaker movement is a Pentecostal movement. Uh, and if you're aware of contemporary charismatic Christianity, you'll know what I mean here. This is a spirit-led, strongly physically embodied spirituality. Quakers aren't called Quakers because they're very quiet and unassuming. They're called Quakers because they physically uh, reveal the way the spirit is working within them in an outward and embodied way. They physically shake and quake in the power of the spirit. Now for early friends, they take very seriously the proclamation that we see in the New Testament in the book of in the, in the Acts of the Apostles at Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. So this is a promise that God makes through the Hebrew prophet Joel, that the early church says has been fulfilled as a result of the Jesus event, the incarnation. Now for early friends, the sense is that generally speaking, the Christian tradition for many hundreds of years, has massively underestimated the radical implications of 
the idea that the Holy Spirit has genuinely been poured out on all flesh. So all people, regardless of who they are, what their ethnicity is, what their proclaimed religion is, what their gender is, what their level of education is, everyone has God in spirit dwelling within them without exception. Think about how radical that is. Of course, for early friends, they felt uh, that not everybody recognized that. In fact, most people didn't recognize that. They often talk about the spirit is held in prison. So you've got God within you, but somehow you, you're not aware of it and it's constrained and uh, in bondage and can't do the work that it's meant to do. But for friends, they felt they'd had the Pentecostal breakthrough. They'd recognized the reality of this spirit poured out on all flesh. They were allowing the spirit to come out of prison to liberate uh, the, uh, the human creature through cleansing and transformation. And they draw very much on the words of the Apostle Paul. He's one of the most important biblical writers for the earliest friends. And one of the things that Paul says in the first letter to the Corinthians is, you, do you not realize that you are the temples of the living God and that the Holy Spirit dwells within you? So this strongly embodied spirituality is based on this experience of knowing God dwelling within you and living through you. Uh, it's the very basis of uh, the Quaker idea of that of God in everyone. We're not saying that humans have got a physical part of God within them, but what, what early friends are saying is because of Pentecost and the fulfillment of that promise, everyone has God in spirit available to them and dwelling within them. And if it's held in prison, it needs to be liberated so that it can do its work. So this is an empowering and sanctifying process, uh, presence. It, uh, it drives out fear. It destroys sin. It liberates people from all the limitations that they find themselves in. And it takes them out into the world to proclaim this new possibility. So the Pentecost is very much the catalyst and the enabler of this vision that we're talking about. Quakerism in its earliest stages as a Pentecostal movement, a charismatic, embodied spirituality. And what this brings with it as the enabler and the, and the catalyst is this possibility of being in a fundamentally different relationship with God in spirit. And so covenant is this idea of covenant being the basis of a relationship. It's not a contract, it's, a, it's the way in which God and humanity relate to one another. Uh, and because of the Jesus event and because of the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh, everyone now can enjoy a new relationship with God in spirit that is both inward, intimate and direct. And again, for early friends, what they notice is that this is a promise that God makes through the prophet Isaiah, chapter 31 of Isaiah, that the New Testament writers proclaim has been fulfilled as a result of the Jesus event. So we see in the book of Hebrews, a very clear proclamation that the description of this new covenant that's promised through the prophet Joel has now been fulfilled. And it's a very different one. Instead of being somehow disconnected from God and only connected through sort of secondary means or mediated means through a priesthood, through an outward physical temple, through uh, the... Uh, the guidance of, of, of a, an outwardly written law in the Bible and so on. This is now a direct, inward, intimate experience that is universally available because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. And really crucially for early friends, this means that when people allow the Spirit to do its work, when they come into this new relationship, they now have uh, an, the inward law and the inward teacher. They know in their hearts what God requires of them because it's written within them. They don't need to be constrained externally and try and follow an external law because it's written within their hearts. They no longer need human teachers because they now have the divine inward teacher. 
uh, who, will sh who will show them what God is like, who will teach them what God requires, who will reveal new things to them and bring them into uh, God's kingdom, into heaven on earth. So it's hard to underestimate the significance of this for early friends. And again, they felt that mainstream Christianity across many hundreds of years had neglected the radical implications of all this. In a sense, uh, uh, early friends are saying what, what went wrong was the church turned away from this new possibility and got caught up again in a rather secondhand mediated style of religion that relied on external physical things when actually everybody had this possibility of the direct inward transformational experience in every single person, every single human, all across the globe without restriction. You can see how radical that might be, but also how threatening to an institutional kind of understanding of the church and also to the power structures of society. Um, this is somewhat outside of their control and therefore very dangerous. Everybody has that direct relationship. You can't kind of control it from, uh, from the normal ways that uh, the human power structures have sought to control religion and use it to to maintain social order in an unjust society. So Pentecost, spirit poured out on all flesh, new covenant, direct inward relationship with God in spirit, so that you know God's law written within your hearts and you have a divine teacher, which means you no longer need human teachers. <clears throat> and this leads to a new way of being human. This is, absolutely one of the most crucial things that Christ achieves in the Jesus event, what I've called the Jesus event, the Jesus, the historical incarnation event. Uh, what has happened is that humans were uh, created to be the image and likeness of God within creation. Something goes wrong and they lose that ability, they turn away from God, they turn away from that inward intimate relationship with God, this is part of the metaphorically what's described in the fall out of the Garden of Eden. And um, what the work of Christ is all about is re-establishing that possibility, taking things back to the way they were at the beginning, what's often called in, uh, in the patristic early church, recapitulation, taking things back to the way they were. Things have gone wrong, take them back to where they'd started from, which was right. And one of the essential things about that is that Christ establishes a new humanity it fully in the image and likeness of God. And humans can now participate in that uh, inwardly and spiritually and reveal that new humanity in their own lives. Uh, and again, this is uh, something that Quakers feel they're reconnecting with that has been lost significantly in the kind of Christianity they, they feel has dominated their culture uh, in recent years. And they draw again on the writings of the Apostle Paul. So this time from Galatians, this idea that it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Uh, my old humanity, what early friends often called life in Adam, the form of humanity where the world had gone wrong, where human nature had become corrupted, that would die through the work of the Holy Spirit so that Christ could be born within you, so that this new life is now revealed within you as a creature. It's not that you are Christ, and this is often what's misunderstood about the early Quaker message, but it's you becoming a vessel through which the Spirit uh, lives and acts, Christ living. Uh, the new humanity living and acting through us as creatures. We become vessels through which God speaks and acts. And that is essentially uh, the definition of the prophetic. To be a prophet is to be a vessel through which God speaks and acts within creation. And one of the radical implications of the early Quaker understanding is that all people potentially now can live in that prophetic way. Because everyone has the spirit within them, because they can enter into that new inward intimate relationship with God, and because they can now reveal this new way of being human, all of us can act in that prophetic way. And indeed for friends, people living in this new possibility, it was always a divine action, divine utterance that was flowing through them, not their own 
self uh, being revealed. And so it's very much a, an idea that what's intended for humanity within creation is that they, are, they live in that prophetic way, live as a vessel through which God speaks and acts within the world. And this is really fundamental to understanding the transformational experience that early friends are having. Can you imagine what it means for all people to now be effectively vessels through which the way of Christ is revealed within the world? The justice, humility, nonviolence and compassion of Christ being revealed through all people and the significance of that in terms of how it transforms human society, how it transforms the whole of the creation, how they could understand that this might be actually heaven on earth. And uh, finally, of course, what goes with all of this as well is the apocalyptic. Now, that's often a very misunderstood uh, term. Uh, but basically what it means biblically is that, what, uh, that the veil is being pulled back. So that's the picture I'm using there, the curtains being pulled back. What had previously been hidden uh, to humanity is now being revealed. And so it's not about destruction, which is often the common understanding. It's about... Uh, a new vision, a new understanding. God, through the Spirit, in because of Pentecost, in this new relationship, in this new humanity, revealing how creation really is, revealing what God is really like, revealing the, uh, the divine intention for the whole of the creation to be completely transfigured and transformed so that the kingdom of God comes, so that heaven is, uh, is, is, is known on earth. Uh, and so in, in many ways for early friends, they feel that they're seeing things in a fundamentally different way. They're seeing creation through divine eyes rather than through the limited perception of, uh, of the creaturely human. So uh, you can see here uh, quite a radical vision of new possibility. And in the earliest years of the Quaker movement, it's that new possibility that really fires friends up to go out into the world and proclaim that all things are being transformed come and join this because god is acting in our time to to transform all things to to overcome the evil powers of the world to establish heaven on earth and so for early friends in a sense to the extent to which they were experiencing it heaven had already come to earth it was something that they felt dwelt within them and that they dwelled within it. So the inward experience of the spirit created an outward life in which heaven and earth were overlapping. The two had become uh, indistinct in a sense and that heaven was no longer separated from earth, but was something that humans could experience. And remember again, all humans, it's a possibility for everyone. They won't necessarily take the offer, but it's a possibility for everyone. And here's um, Dorothy White, an important prophetic woman writer of the first generation, giving a very clear, I think, and powerful description of this new experience. And this is what she writes uh, in 1660. Thus is the living God purifying his temples, and he is making a glorious situation, a heavenly habitation, and an everlasting dwelling place in the sons and daughters of men. For God is now come to dwell in his people. So you might struggle a bit with the language there, but I hope you can see how radical that vision is. When uh, Dorothy White says that God's purifying his temples, what he means is that the human creature, the human, humans collectively are the temples of the living God. And uh, what has gone wrong with them, in a sense, the way they've become corrupted, spiritually dead, unable to see the truth, that is being purified, that's being cleansed, it's made possible that they can have this glorious situation, this heavenly habitation of knowing God dwelling within them. And note, sons and daughters, this is something that transcends those sorts of gender divisions. God has come to dwell in his people, and his people, God's people, is now anyone living in that new possibility. And we've already noted on a number of occasions that that possibility is not confined. It's universal. It's available to everyone because the spirit has been poured out on all flesh. 
And so in many ways for early friends, heaven on earth was uh, something to do with the experience of abiding in the divine dimension of reality. This was a fundamentally new way of being human, a new experience, a new relationship, a new perception. It's not that it wasn't always there, but it's just, a, it's just that humans weren't incapable of understanding it and knowing it until this new possibility had been uh, started and enabled by first the Jesus event and then the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And there's a very strong sense for early friends that when the world had gone wrong, when human nature had become corrupted, um, humans were scattered and divided, scattered around the globe, divided by uh, all sorts of forms of divisions, cultural, language, religion, all uh, social class, uh, the divisions between men and women. This is the negative implications of wrong relationship with God, wrong relationship with one another, a wrong relationship with the whole of creation. We are scattered and we are divided. But in this new possibility, we see humanity being gathered into a oneness. In a sense, what had, been, uh, what had gone wrong was being put right. What had been scattered and divided was being drawn back into uh, a oneness. But it's important to emphasize that uh, that oneness is not sameness. Uh, we see very strongly the sense of a unity in diversity. And again, for early friends, the way in which Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, talks about the human community uh, by comparing it to the body, using a body metaphor. This is helpful in understanding this idea of oneness as a unity in diversity. The body is one, uh, but it has lots of parts and all of the parts need to do their role and they have different functions and they all have a significance. In fact, Paul actually says that the bits of the body that we usually think of as, as the least important are actually the most important. So this is another way in which the ways of the world are turned upside down. But this is uh, quite an ecological kind of idea in this oneness, in this unity, it's a unity in diversity with lots of different uh, aspects to it that need to all work together to make it, uh, to make it function as a healthy body. Uh, what's most important for friends though is who is the head of that body? And of course, in this new humanity, it's, it's God who is the head of humanity. It is Christ in spirit that rules within his people and we'll see some of the radical implications of that as we work through this material. And so we see Quakers feeling as though they are uh, transcending some of the limitations of the earthly and they're, and they're finding their true being in the eternal. Fox often talked about uh, meet together in the things of the, uh, the eternal. And so the heavenly dimension of reality is in a sense eternal and unchanging. It is, uh, it is the fundamental deeper truth about how things really are and how they are ordered and how they fit together. <coughs> and in that context, of course, earthly structures, earthly human authorities and governments and, and so on, and uh, uh, dominant social structures that we were talking about earlier, are actually not eternal and not unchanging. They are temporary, they are forever changing. And certainly for early friends, the sense was that these old ways were dying because a new way was coming. So the old structures, the old authorities of, of, of earthly kind of dimension of reality were fading away and dying because the divine rule, the divine authority, heaven on earth was coming to take their place. And so that raises really big questions about what place do those outward divisions have in heaven on earth? Does cl social class, do, div do gender divisions, does, do, do religious divisions and cultural divisions and different governments and power systems have any validity within this new vision of heaven on earth? In a sense, we might argue that those are all uh, temporary and ephemeral things and they are actually being transcended by a deeper truth, a deeper reality, uh, the eternal, uh, the heavenly dimension, the transfiguration and transformation of 
all things, humanity and the rest of the creation. This is something of this radical vision that we see in those earliest years. And so um, you can see how radical this is. For some people, it seemed complete madness. And you may take that view. But of course, for friends, they felt that they could do no other than affirm what they'd found to be true in their own experience. And it has all sorts of radical implications for the way the world is and for the way friends feel it's going to be and for the way Quakers operate as a people in these earliest few years. So first of all, let's think about social hierarchy and inequality. This very rigid, hierarchically divided society with uh, a small number of people at the top tending to be uh, the king or the emperor right at the top and then the aristocracy and the gentry and the mass of ordinary people, the dregs of the common people, as we said before, at the bottom, fundamentally inferior, fundamentally born to serve. Some small numbers of people born, ordained by God to rule the mass of people born and ordained by God to serve. Well, what we see with early friends is uh, time and time again, they use the words of uh, the Apostle Peter in Acts of the Apostles, where Peter says, God is no respecter of persons. The, the divine dimension doesn't recognize those outward uh, divisions that have been created in a world gone wrong. All creatures are creatures, they are not God. And so all creatures are to be equally humble before God. So this somehow is a, a slightly different understanding than our modern conceptions of equality, but it's a, a recognition that um, God is God, humans are humans, um, and um, it is God that is the one that's above, in a sense, and all creatures, all humans are equally humble before God. Um, and uh, the social divisions, the rigid hierarchy, the social class structures of, of the world are the consequences of this fallen state, this world gone wrong, this human nature having been corrupted. And that turns the dominant understanding of uh, European culture on its head. In European Christendom, the accepted position was that the fundamental structure of society, this pyramid, uh, had been divinely ordained. It was God's intention for some to rule and some to serve. But Quakers, like other radical groups at the time, are essentially saying, no, social divisions are a consequence of the fall. They're a consequence of something that's gone wrong. They are unjust and they do not reflect how humanity is meant to be in the image of likeness of God. Uh, and indeed, when some people raise themselves up above their brothers and sisters and regard themselves as fundamentally superior and regard everyone else as fundamentally inferior and require acts of deference towards them because they're superior in their view, that is idolatry because it is people demanding the worship of other humans when only God is to be worshipped. So you can see how threatening this might be to a class-based hierarchical society. God, no respecter of persons. Everyone's equally humble before God. Social divisions are actually something that's happened because of the way things have gone wrong. And those people who raise themselves up above everybody else are guilty of idolatry, a great, uh, a great sin in a sense. And here's uh, James Naylor in full prophetic form, uh, uh, sort of denouncing this, uh, this corrupted reality. Uh, it's in his first self-authored tract, A Discovery of the First Wisdom from uh, Below and the Second Wisdom from Above, uh, published in uh, 1653, so right at the beginning. And he writes, God is against you, you covetous, cruel oppressors who grind the faces of the poor and needy, taking your advantage of the necessities of the poor, falsifying the measures and using deceitful weights, deceiving the simple, and hereby getting great estates in the world, laying house to house and land to land, till they be no place for the poor. And when they become poor through your deceits, then you despise them and exalt yourselves above them. 
what shall your riches avail you uh, at, the, at that day when you must account how you have gotten them and whom you have oppressed? So a very powerful denunciation of social injustice, economic injustice. Some people cruelly oppress others, grind the faces of, you know, exploit ordinary poor people, uh, not only exploit them, but also uh, trick them and cheat them uh, and falsify things in order to gain wealth and power. Um, and in doing that, they do gain great power and that gives them greater authority and great respectability and all the rest of it. And in doing that, then they begin to look down on the very people they've exploited and treated so badly in order to gain their, uh, their wealth in the first place. And this is, this is, not, this is contrary to God's intention. Uh, and indeed, what Naylor is su suggesting here is that those who oppress the poor in order to gain wealth and look down on people will face judgment, they will face the consequences of that, because that's not the order of things uh, in the heavenly dimension, in the divine dimension of reality. And you can see why that might be so threatening to those in power. Maybe it's no surprise that James Naylor is the one who suffers a show trial, brutal kind of torture and imprisonment, and a crushing by those in power, given how threatening that must be to the powers of his day. We come on to gender divisions, another key division that's associated with a world that's gone wrong. Uh, the division between men and women and the, uh, the, the inequality and un injustice of that are very much seen to be a consequence of this fallen uh, out of right relationship with God, the fall out of the Garden of Eden, metaphorically. <clears throat> now, for early friends, because they believe that that's being put right and people are entering into a new relationship with, uh, with God in spirit and entering into that new way of being human that transcends those old ways, uh, they feel that that's also healing the divisions between men and women. This is quite binary because, of course, in the culture of the time, uh, there wasn't the same awareness we have today about gender and sexual uh, diversity. But it's still one of the most radical aspects of the early Quaker experience and message, the fundamental spiritual equality of women and men. And again, early friends are drawing on what they see the, the Apostle Paul writing about this in the earliest church. And so, as we said before, uh, Paul's, Paul in uh, Galatians writes that he's no longer he who lives, but Christ that lives in him. Uh, and so, actually, for a woman, it is no longer her um, old way in the outward fallen form of humanity that's living. It's now that Christ is living through the woman. And if Christ is living and speaking and acting through the woman, how dare anyone stop that happening? How dare anyone stop Christ acting and speaking through the sister, through the woman? That's a great sin to do that. And so for early, early Quaker women, this was a massively empowering possibility. I'm not limited by those outward physical divisions anymore because I have God dwelling within me and living through me and speaking and acting through me. And that gives me great power and great uh, uh, validity in a sense, an authority. Uh, it's not in my creaturely self that I have that authority, but it's that uh, sense of God acting through me. And Paul also says, of course, in the same letter to the Galatians, in this new possibility, there is no longer male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So there's a sense in which this, in this new possibility, the old divisions are transcended in some fundamental way. And so in the new life, women could affirm that Christ was speaking and acting through them, as well as, as, well as the men, uh, and they could be publicly visible prophets, preachers, writers, uh, and often in a very kind of powerful way. Now, in a rigidly patriarchal society, the visible presence of fearless, uh, powerful women preaching and speaking and acting in society was deeply outrageous and threatening to the accepted social structures. Here we see a couple of short uh, words from early friends. First of all, from uh, Sarah Blackborough. These are both writings from the 1650s. 
Sarah Bratbro writes, uh, Christ was one in the, fem in the male and in the female, and as he arises in both. So we get that sense of, um, in this new possibility, the spirit working within people means that Christ arises within them, becomes the very source of their life and what lives through them, both men and women, and so transcending the limitations that had previously been experienced. And then two other first-generation Quaker women, Priscilla Cotton and Mary Cole, again referring to Paul's words, thou tellest the people, women must not speak in church, whereas it is spoke only of a female, for we are all both male and female in Christ Jesus. So there's a sense in which the church is both uh, the body of Christ, with the, the, with the Christ being the head, the, the body is the, is the bride, Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the, is the woman, uh, Christ is the, is the husband, um, and the union of those things transcends the old outward ways of understanding things. And women take their place in that new body, in that new humanity, um, and people should not seek to prevent women who are living in that new birth from speaking and acting publicly because it's Christ that's speaking and acting through them. A radical kind of vision in a deeply, rigidly patriarchal society. We also see a similar um, uh, process happening in terms of Quaker attitudes to other cultures, other races and other religions. So if you think about it, this idea of the inward intimate relationship with God being possible for everyone universally because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh, then it has to be possible for people who are living outside of a Christian culture, outside of the European context. Uh, and so early friends very strongly asserted the idea that people elsewhere in the world, whether they knew about Jesus or not, whether they had access to the Bible or not, had that spirit within them, and if they turned to it, it would do its work and transform them and bring them into this new possibility. And so the cultural divisions become seen to be earthly and temporary. They are not the fundamental truth at a deeper level. And that enables early friends to have a relatively enlightened attitude to people of other religions of other cultures, when normally within European culture and English culture, those other cult uh, cultures and peoples were regarded in a very, very negative way. And Quakers have contacts fairly early on because they travel so widely with Jewish communities, uh, with Muslims in various parts of the world, in the Ottoman Empire, North Africa, and so on. Uh, and with Native Americans and so on in, uh, in, uh, in the colonies in, in, in America. And um, uh, there are real limitations to this, and we'll see that in the second part of this uh, seminar. But it does enable a slightly different view. All people have this possibility, and so we need to take that seriously. That changes our perception of people who are different from us. This is quite a famous uh, piece from Mary Fisher, who's one of the people that goes to the Ottoman Empire and meets with the Sultan, who was obviously uh, what they would call a Turk, um, uh, a follower of Islam, a Muslim. Uh, and she writes, there is a royal seed amongst them, which in time God will raise. They are more near truth than many nations. There is a love begot in me towards them, which is endless. But this is my hope concerning them, that he who hath raised me to love them more than many others, will also raise his seed in them, unto which my love is. Nevertheless, though they be called Turks, the seed of them is near unto God, and their kindness hath in some measure been shown towards his servants. So we can see that what this new experience makes possible for Mary Fisher is to recognize the potential in people, such as the, the Turk, who's regarded normally as the great threat, evil, um, uh, separated from true faith, destined to hell. Actually, the truth is close to them. The potential is in them. The spirit is available to them. They can experience what we've experienced. It's not limited by where they are and who they are.
And then we have this whole new perception of uh, the physical creation uh, in spirit, uh, in this new possibility, the creation can be seen uh, through divine eyes. Uh, in the new life, people are brought out of a dysfunctional and uh, wrong relationship with God and brought into a right and harmonious relationship with God and therefore with the rest of the creation. Um, and, um, and so we see again the healing of a fundamental division, the division between the human creature and the rest of the creation. James Naylor talks about life in Adam, life in the first birth. Hum uh, humans have become uh, uh, devourers of the just and the creation. But in this new possibility, they're brought back into right relationship with uh, the creation. Really significant for our contemporary concerns for uh, uh, environmental sustainability and ecology. But more than that, in this new possibility, humans become vessels through which divine love and wisdom flows out onto the rest of the creation. And so instead of being uh, devourers of the creation, a, a curse on the creation, humans in a destructive relationship with the rest of the natural world, in this new possibility, humans can again become uh, the vessel through which something really health-giving and vital is poured out on the rest of the creation, divine love and wisdom. See this uh, uh, hinted at in this amazing piece by George Fox, quite famous, I think, that gives this sense of this new perception. I call it the creation apocalyptic, the new vision of all things. And Fox writes, now I, I was come up in the spirit through the flaming sword into the paradise of God. All things were new and all the creation gave uh, gave unto me another smell than before, beyond what words can utter. I knew nothing but pureness and innocency and righteousness, being reviewed into the image of God by Christ Jesus to the state of Adam, which he was in before he fell. The creation was opened to me and was shown me how all things had their names given them according to their nature and virtue. So you can see in this vision. Um, a sense of a fundamentally different perception of the whole of the rest of the creation. We can see a very physical and, and, uh, and a visceral change in understanding. You know, Fox talks about uh, getting a, another smell beyond what words can utter. This is a very kind of mystical and transformational understanding uh, that, is, uh, that is a possibility because of this new experience, the, the veil having been pulled aside, seeing all things new. And finally, human governments, what implications does this have for human authorities? Well, in the new life, Christ is the only true king. The authority of earthly governments, therefore, are strictly limited. Christ is the eternal ruler, lawgiver and teacher. Uh, and therefore, in the new humanity, People are ruled by Christ and therefore no longer need to be constrained by earthly authority. They, this is something about heaven on earth, something about the new kingdom. It's the rule of Christ in spirit within people. So they know the law within them. They know what's required of them. They're able to live, uh, uh, Christ live through them and therefore no longer need the constraining power of human authority. Now, early friends accepted that human government was ordained by God to control evil in the context of a world gone wrong. But in this new possibility, its use was being lost. In this new life, people lived and rule, uh, with the rule of Christ and they didn't need to be constrained by human authority. Now again, you can see how uh, threatening that might be to earthly governments at the time. Where do people's loyalty lie? Well, the, our loyalty is to Christ and the rule of Christ that's living through us. Um, uh, our ultimate authority is there, and so uh, our, our uh, loyalty to earthly authorities is inevitably limited in some way. And here, uh, just to end here, Naylor kind of describing that in uh, one of his later tracts. There is no kingdom nor people that can be truly said to be the Lord's and his Christ's, but as they come to be guided and governed by the law of his spirit in their consciences which spirit and anointing all must wait for, even from the king that sits on high to the least place of government in any people, that with it all may know judgment and do justice, 
which is of God and not of men. And so this kind of vision of how are humans governed in, the, in heaven on earth, in the, in the kingdom of God, where they're governed by this inward experience of, of God, uh, God's law within them, God's teaching within them. They are ruled by Christ. They live in the new humanity by that, that means. They don't need the constraining power of human uh, authority structures in order for them to live this new life uh, in justice, in peace, and in compassion. And this is essentially what's so uh, radical about the early vision, why for a very short period of time, it seemed like the Quakers were gonna turn the world upside down. Everything that was assumed to be normal within the outward earthly form was being overturned by this new possibility. Christ ruling within people, uh, divisions between classes and genders and cultures being overcome. Everything that had been scattered and, and, uh, and divided brought back into a unity in diversity. Um, sadly, it's a vision that had a major impact for a short period of time, but it didn't last very long because the world attacked it and sought to destroy it. And we'll look at the implications of that in the second part of our, uh, of our seminar.